Ladies and gentlemen, a few minutes behind schedule, but anyway, there we are. Welcome at yet another PBL Academy lecture. Part of an by now established tradition of biannual lectures in which we try to bring new insights and innovative knowledge with regard to the lived environment of touch with Dutch professionals and policymakers. My name is Hans Momaas. I'm the Director General of PBL, the Netherlands Environmental Assessment Agency. At PBL, we produce and deliver strategic knowledge to enhance Dutch national policy making in the fields of nature, the environment, and spatial planning. As we say, at the forefront of knowledge production in the midst of policy making, independent, science based, and yet involved. Today we want to speak about the global biodiversity crisis and the related global transformative change needed. Next to the issue of climate change, the biodiversity crisis will be on everybody's minds for the months to come. Just the other day, we witnessed the closure of COP26 at Glasgow with the Glasgow Climate Pact. Whatever you might like to think of it, whether you regard this, this, this as a glass half full or a glass half empty, so much is clear. There is a global agenda, a global narrative, and a global accounting mechanism, which at least enables us to talk results to each other and steer a global line of action, both amongst nation states, but also amongst regions, cities, companies, and civic organizations. It is even keeping the United States and China in a common communication and action line. Hopefully, together with Europe, this coalition is able to keep the ball rolling towards the Paris targets, also producing a just, just global balancing of costs and benefits. But behind the back of COP26, there is yet another COP asking our attention, COP15 to be held in Kunming, China, in April. Also previously postponed because of COVID, but now on track to be physically organized. The first part has already taken place in a virtual form in October of this year. The second part of COP15 will be a face-to-face -face meeting in Kunming, China, from the 25th of April until the 8th of May, 2022. At stake is the global state of nature, of species and systems, ecosystems, and the related relation between man and nature. Today we want to talk about that crisis, that second crisis, the biodiversity crisis. As said, the global science policy interface is preparing for the second segment of the 15th Conference of the Parties to the Convention of Biological Diversity. The work is framed by the Global Biodiversity Framework, the GBF, a strategy and roadmap for nature by 2030 and 2050. The stakes are high. Virtually all reports of the state of nature and of trends and projections for the rest of the century point to a rapidly closing window for action. With the global biodiversity framework, will that do its job? How should the next level of global nature policy ambitions and in its slipstream, the various regional and national nature policy frameworks look like. To discuss this, we are delighted to have in our midst Professor Sandra Miena Diaz. Welcome, Professor Diaz. Good to see you. How are you? Hello, uh, I'm very well, thank you. Um, and hello, everyone. I am really delighted and honored to be given this opportunity to speak to you all. Where are you at the moment? And what time is it at your place? Um, I am in Cordoba, Argentina, where I live and work. Mm -hmm. it's, the, it's the morning here. Right, okay. We'll, we will be speaking to each other later on. I will start by introducing you and then introduce your lecture. So, Professor Sandra Mina Diaz, she is an internationally acclaimed professor of ecology at the National University of Córdoba in Argentina. She studies the functional traits of plants and investigates how plants impact the ecosystem. 
She is one of the top 1% most cited scientists in the world. She was elected a foreign member of the Royal Society in 2019. Professor Diaz is also a co-chair of the EPBEST Global Assessment Report on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. And as such, also had a major role to play in the coming into being of the current draft for a post-2020 global biodiversity framework. In her PBL Academy lecture, titled Global Goals and Targets for the Fabric of Life, she will discuss some major strengths and weaknesses of the GBF in view of the latest ecological scientific evidence. The lecture will argue for the need to go beyond tackling isolated rifles of nature's decline by trying to project nature, to protect nature from human influence towards realizing in practice the complex connections, both local and remote, between humans and the rest of the fabric of life. By the way, Professor Diaz's lecture was pre-recorded last week, just to prevent possible technical problems. Halfway, Professor Diaz and I will have a small chat about one of the elements she will be proposing in her lecture. But for now, I would like to give the floor to Professor Diaz. Please start the lecture. As an academic ecologist, I sometimes wonder how on earth I ended up talking about policy goals to people who work in policy every day. And the reason is this. As we speak, the almost 200 countries that have signed the Convention on Biological Diversity, or CBD, the most important biodiversity global policy mechanism in existence are drafting a strategy for nature on the planet for the next 30 years. And they are doing this haunted by two looming ghosts. The overwhelming evidence that biodiversity is declining fast globally and the spectacular failure of the previous global strategy and its 20 Aichi targets, none of which was fully achieved. So no wonder the parties are working hard and treading carefully. Key to this process of charting a new strategy is this boring looking document called the Post-2020 Biodiversity Framework. This still a draft, being written and negotiated intensely for more than two years now. And its final version will be enshrined by the parties, hopefully in May 2022. And it will become the most important international biodiversity policy instrument of the next decade. This uh, framework is quite an improvement from previous CBD policy documents in several ways. One important way in which is better is that for the first time, it has an explicit theory of change. And second, it has taken more input from science than any previous document. In this context, in 2020, I chaired a group of more than 60 biodiversity scientists from all over the world to provide collective input to the draft of the global biodiversity framework. Specifically, specifically we were asked to give input to the section in red, the section on biodiversity outcomes. We submitted the product of our work as a formal policy report to the CBD and further distill our findings and recommendations in a piece that was published in the journal Science. Now, I'm delighted to say that the new version of the Global Biodiversity Framework has taken up quite a lot of our material and recommendations. 
the present text of the global biodiversity framework is not perfect but relies on scientific evidence to an unprecedented degree <clears throat> now the story is a bit different if one listens to the speeches and pledges and discussions during the first part of the United Nations Biodiversity Conference, or COP15, which took place a few weeks ago. There are important differences between the Global Biodiversity Framework text, which is, as I say, strongly science-based and nuanced, and the public speeches and pledges made by the governments and also the various stakeholders present at COP. And because the draft can change uh, substantially between now and May 2022, there is a bit of a concern of which one if the tone of the pledges or the tone of the present text will prevail in the end. <clears throat> there are uh, many details in the global biodiversity framework which I could discuss, but fortunately for you, we only have half an hour. So I will focus on a very small set of issues. If we look at the theory of change, there are four major elements here. The present state and trends of nature, the mission or what to do about this state of nature, the nature outcomes or what we would like nature to look like in 10 or 30 years, and the overall inspiring aspiration, the vision that drives the whole thing. I will simply shine a spotlight here, mostly on ecological issues, because this is the area in which I have better expertise. And I will focus just on two kinds of potential discrepancies. First, discrepancies between the desirable outcomes for nature and the action targets and resources proposed to make them happen. And second, I will spend most of my time on the discrepancies between the scientific evidence and the stated desirable outcomes for nature. Discrepancies type one are related to the glaring distance, the glaring discrepancy between the huge ambition of the desired outcomes and the skeletal actions and resources pledged so far to achieve them. Been only a little bit cartoonish, this summarizes it. I will not spend much time on this because it's obvious to everyone, and in my view, this is not a knowledge limitation, but rather a will and courage and power limitation. So there's not much else to say in a lecture like this. Let's move to discrepancies type two between uh, the scientific evidence and the desirable outcomes. I will not burden you with a detailed description of the deplorable state of nature. It has been widely communicated in the scientific literature and the media. Just to summarize, according to the IBES Global Assessment, the most comprehensive to date, all the indicators of the state of life on Earth, from genes to biomes, are declining globally. And the vast majority of nature's contributions to people are also declining worldwide. At the same time, one general conclusion, which you probably suspected all along, but on which the IBES Global Assessment shines a particularly strong spotlight is the fact that we have 
deep and ancient links with the rest of the planet. Evolutionary, physical, psychological, socioeconomic links. All the evidence points to an inextricable interweaving, a constant exchange between people and the rest of the living, for better or worse, rather than a neat separation between them. So today, I prefer this definition of biodiversity or nature. I prefer to refer to the fabric of life on Earth, given by natural processes over millions of years and in conjunction with people for many thousands of years. So this fabric is being co-created deliberately or otherwise with humans. We are embedded in it. So it's not only about nutrients, water, energy, genes, it's also about institutions, livelihoods and stories. Sure, this definition is just a metaphor. But then the other conceptualizations we have been using all the time to refer to our relationship with nature are also simply metaphors. We are just more used to them. And you may be wondering, why should we pay attention to metaphors in such a critical moment? Precisely because action is urgent. Metaphors are not just labels. Metaphors help us make sense of the world. They provide a scaffolding for thinking, which in turn frames action. And to me, this fabric of life framing leads to actions and priorities quite different from those based on a paradigm of stark separation between people and the rest of the living. That is why I chose to include the fabric of life in the title of my lecture. And I'm pleased to say that this fabric of life narrative is slowly encroaching the public discourse. It looks like very different people seem to resonate with it. Unfortunately, the actions proposed in the International Science Policy Interface on Biodiversity appear to be still firmly anchored on the separation paradigm. For example, the favorite way to enhance nature seems to create protected areas, as pristine and people-free as possible. Now, let's examine for a minute the assumptions behind this Back to Eden narrative with its strong emphasis on untouched ecosystems. Where are those intact wildernesses? Well, there seems to be precious little left. For terrestrial ecosystems, the consensus is somewhere between a quarter and a fifth of the total area of the planet at most. And this state of things is not something new. It's the result of a very ancient process. The total surface of intact wilderness, here showed uh, in, the, in the red brackets, has not changed much in thousands of years. What has changed dramatically is the style in which humans use and appropriate already inhabited landscapes. So nature on earth is human nature because we have been reconfiguring it extensively and for a very long time. But at the same time, this evidence is presented to us. Among all the pledges being made at COP, 
if there is one on which there seems to be wide agreement, is the one on the protection of about one third of the planet by 2030, the so-called 30 by 30 pledge. Now, said as simply as that, as a blanket statement without any qualification, this runs the risk of perpetuating the separation paradigm by emphasizing primeval people-free nature and trying to solve the problem by just fencing people off. <clears throat> of course, the last intact wilderness have to be preserved, but I'm worried about the remaining 70% at least, which is far more representative of life on Earth today, and which so far has not featured prominently enough in the negotiations and pledges. In my view, there should be much more explicit emphasis on the so-called working or shared landscapes and seascapes. Why is that? Because the working and, and shared landscapes make up the vast proportion of the planet and we need to look after nature wherever we can find it. Because these are the landscapes where people work and live and many nature's contributions to people require proximity to humans to be enjoyed. And because without these landscapes, there would be no connectivity between larger, more intact and more glamorous areas. So this is one major discrepancy, potential discrepancy at least, between the consensus scientific evidence and the targets proposed so far. Professor Diaz, let's stop there for a short minute uh, because we are, in, I think, in, in a critical moment in your lecture, a, a very important moment because you're positioning this notion of working or shared landscapes as a very vital uh, 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 position, a very vital position in your perspective. And you're linking it also in your lecture to, I think, uh, something like 20% native habitat and 20% native habitat target. To give us an impression of what such a working landscape would look like, can you give us an image of it? Would it, would it be possible in the Netherlands, for instance, with our very intensive agricultural economy? Um, that's an excellent question. Um, I, I don't know the, the Dutch countryside well enough, but I know, for example, the British countryside, the agricultural British countryside, that is, I guess, not terribly different. I think that uh, it should be possible in the, in the sense that uh, we, we did a study I show in the slide mm -hmm. uh, using a number of data and modeling for many countries in the world. And ecologically, depending on what the crop is, with allowing between 10 and 20% of native nature within the working landscapes, I'm talking about small groves, uh, uh, head roads, just bit patches. It doesn't have to be the most intact and primeval in, uh, nature. Mm -hmm. Allowing that, depending on the crop, you actually get a very small decrease in yield or even an increase in yield. Yeah. 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 Depending on the on the on the dependence of the crop on on pollinators and, and other uh, benefits from nature. Mm -hmm. So 10% would be an amount that wouldn't need any uh, loss of economic uh, profit. Now, we are pushing for 20%. Why? Because with 20%, the nature's contributions to people uh, increase a lot. Mm -hmm. And in terms of uh, economic loss, again, you have either a very small loss or even an increase in yield, depending on the kind of system. 
Okay. And we propose that if uh, governments were prepared to help farmers with that little bit of loss uh, by redirecting subsidies to this rather than to indiscriminate use of uh, herbicides and pesticides, then there will be a win-win for everybody. Okay. Thank you very much. That's giving us an impression of what you mean, and I think we can pick it up later on in the discussion. But for the moment, let's continue with your lecture. Thank you. Another way in which the pledges and banners around COP15 seem to depart from the scientific consensus and also from a fabric of life perspective is uh, by trying to focus on a so-called apex target. What is an apex IPEX target is an overarching goal focused on only one facet of nature, for example, ecosystems or species, as a proxy for the whole of multifaceted nature. By the way, by facets of nature, I mean ecosystems, species, genetic diversity, phylogenetic history, and also nature's contributions to people. Of course, it's true that from a communication point of view, it, it would be great to converge into a single quantitative simple pledge, like the one for climate change, no more than 1.5 degrees Celsius of temperature increase. And there is very good science behind each of these proposals. So we don't question them in themselves. What we do question is using them as the only proxy or flagship for all the other facets of the living world. And we question this because of the way in which different facets of nature relate to each other. Let me explain a bit more. If these facets were perfectly nested into one another like Russian dolls, then a single concise goal that specifies one number about the most encompassing facet, for example, a target surface of ecosystem protected or a target extinction rate for species, could perhaps <clears throat> adequately cover all of them. However, although the facets of nature are deeply interlinked, they are far from neatly nested like Russian dolls. They interweave in the intricate fabric of life and each of them needs to be addressed explicitly and at the same time in combination with the others. So what to do? Here is a tight synthesis of the recommendations we presented in our paper. Of course, I don't expect you to read all this now, but let me share the gist with you. If we are to achieve the CBD 2050 vision, we need explicit goals for all the facets, ecosystems, species, genes, and nature's contributions to people. And we need each of them <laughs> at the highest possible level of ambition supported by science, represented here by the green light. If we have <clears throat> ambitions for one of the facets, but low ambitions for another, the whole thing will stop working because the facets are interconnected. For example, a high ambition in terms of ecosystem area protected without at the same time considering genetic diversity targets may lead to the extinction of fragmented populations of, of mega herbivores, which are key to maintaining the structure of the very ecosystems we want to protect. 
or may lead to the loss of the wild relatives of some key crops that feed the world because these wild relatives tend to thrive in not terribly pristine areas which don't tend to be prioritized for the creation of new national parks. So using a single facet goal as the only proxy for global biodiversity policy, for example, zero extinction or nature needs half, is more or less analogous to using blood pressure or body mass index as the sole proxy for the vision of vibrant health. It's simple, but is risky. In summary, there is no single goal based on any one facet of nature that would guarantee a safe outcome for the other facets. We need all facets with specific goals, each of them at the highest possible ambition level. And there is progress in this respect in the present draft of the Global Biodiversity Framework. Here I, I just copied the main goals and I indicated the different facets in blue. You can see they are all tightly scrunched together in one long and complex mega goal A, but at least most of them, with the exception of phylogenetic history, are there explicitly. I hope this explicitness and interdependence are not lost in the final formulation of goals and targets in May. Now, yet another potential discrepancy between the most popular goals and targets and the scientific consensus is about what are the main causes of nature's decline. There are some clear smoking guns, so to speak, factors and activities that act locally by damaging nature by direct physical contact. But it's now very clear that most of these impacts are originated remotely in diffuse, pervasive socioeconomic factors. We have now an unprecedented level of global connectivity or telecoupling. For example, over the past 50 years, international trade has increased 900%. And around 30% of the threats to animals worldwide are associated with international trade including more than 150 threats around the world that can be traced directly or indirectly to demands from the Netherlands. You may be relieved to know that it's not the worst. The US and Japan, for example, are responsible for more than a thousand threats each. And this other article shows another lesser known but pervasive and critically important teleconnected indirect driver of nature's decline. Foreign investment and tax havens. In this case, fueling nature's deterioration associated to agriculture in the Amazon. And there are many other examples around the world. What I'm trying to convey with this uh, case studies, is that this interweaving of the fabric of life occurs not just locally, but often over long distances, sometimes at the level of the whole planet. These teleconnected economic systems are among the most pervasive and systemic root causes of nature's decline. And so far, they have been paid not enough attention in the pledges. So, wrapping it all up, what would it involve to consider the new international biodiversity goals and targets in the light of the fabric of life? First, 
A fabric of life perspective poses some questions about the 30 by 30 pledge. And I do stress this is not necessarily opposition. I just think that many questions need to be answered clearly for this proposal to work well. For example, what do we mean by protection? Strict protection, national park style, or other effective area-based conservation measures as well. Where are we going to put the protected areas? No question that the last wildernesses, the very small percentage of the earth surface that shows globally outstanding ecological integrity, need to be protected effectively. But beyond them, where are we going to put the extra surface to be protected? A very important question is, how do we know they will work for nature? Protection is a management tool, not an end in itself. A clear illustration, Aichi target 11, regarding the percentage of the Earth's surface to be protected, was the only one that we came close to achieve in 2020. However, biodiversity kept going down. So this time, if we just maximize area under formal protection, we may end up ticking the 30 by 30 box with no substantial biodiversity recovery. And finally, will this 30 by 30 pledge take up all the attention and resources from other important goals, prominently from the remaining 70% remaining of the planet? Regarding the remaining 70%, I would like to see, together with the pledges about protected wilderness areas, some explicit ambitious incentives for keeping some proportion of wild native habitat within working and urban landscapes. The vast majority of the earth surface where people live and work and where the opportunity, to co uh, the opportunity cost of the land is high. Another, very important way to internalize the fabric of life perspective would be to consider teleconnections and indirect drivers much more. To tackle systemic global causes of nature decline deeply embedded in the supply chains. For example, a good start could be to calculate a country's biodiversity footprint as the result of all its operation and demands around the world, not just those within its home, home territory. And finally, the devil in the details. The wording of the document that is going to be agreed in May 2022 will be crucial for the future of life on Earth. By itself, the text is, of course, not going to be enough to ensure nature's recovery, but it can set the stage for success or failure. So, if one of you, if some of you are going to be in the negotiation teams for the Netherlands or for the European Union at COP15 in May, in our paper, we put together something thinking especially of you. And this is what we put together, a summary card of specific technical elements to be included in the formulation of goals and targets for ecosystems, species, genetic diversity, and nature's contributions to people. Now, these elements may appear too detailed to you, but they can greatly enhance the usefulness of the new text. And the summary card, although it's based in extensive evidence, 
is short enough to fit in a cell phone screen and therefore can come really handy in the middle of a negotiation to include missing elements or to make sure that some apparently trivial elements are not removed from the final text. So, in conclusion, these are my views of what would entail to um, incorporate a fabric of life approach to the new biodiversity goals and targets. It all boils down to stop focusing only on fixing nature or isolating it from us and start tackling for real what is harming it every day. And also boils down to being nature inclusive in all places and in all sectors of the economy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Diaz, for your clear and insistent message. Let me just summarize it uh, in brief. Running up to COP15 in Kunming and to the new biodiversity framework related, we better move away from focusing on single facet targets, often founded on too narrow an idea of the separation of man and nature. It is a paradigm which in many ways doesn't do justice, according to you, to the global state of nature anyway. Instead, we have to move towards, as you call it, a fabric of life approach, at least containing something of a dashboard of targets, including attention for the quality of ecosystems, the diversity of species and genes, and nature's contribution to people. Not just on a specific local, but on an interrelated global scale. Now, for the discussion, the question could be how we appreciate such a viewpoint, and next, how can we operationalize such a viewpoint in an accountable policy framework? What is, for instance, our experience in the Netherlands with broadening nature policy ambitions targets from biodiversity alone to also include socio and economic targets? To open up the discussion, about your viewpoints and on what that would imply for nature-based policies and their targets and indicators, we have two discussions. Let me briefly introduce them to you and our audience. The first is Johan Ozinga, Director General of the Department of Nature, Fishery and Rural Areas of the Netherlands Ministry of Agriculture, Nature and Food Quality. And the second is Jolinda van der Ent, director of B12. We didn't find a proper English translation of that. But anyway, it's the Dutch organization which supports the Dutch provinces in, amongst others, their biodiversity and nature policies. Johan, may I ask you to give your comments on Professor Diaz's presentation? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Hans, and thank you. Uh, I've got to start this up and get it working. Thank you, Hans, and thank you, uh, Professor Diaz, for your cl very clear and inspiring speech. A story about nature where things are not going well, that's for sure. And also an argument about necessary changes in the relationship between nature and mankind, nature and how it's used by humans. Without this vital nature, we have no clean air, no clean water, and we miss out all kinds of ecosystem services. Holes are forming in this fine tissue that forms the basis of our lives. The fab fabric of life is becoming seriously damaged. So it's clear that something has to be done, but what? The Netherlands is strongly committed to an ambitious global biodiversity framework, an ambitious framework which is not only ambitious in the targets that it sets, but also equally, or even maybe more important, ambitious in the effective and efficient implementation of it. Our 
may I say between quotes, classic nature policy aimed at protecting and possibly expanding nature reserves. Let's say separation, it is still badly needed. But it is clearly not enough, as Professor Diaz pointed out. Additional or even new policies are also needed, for example, focusing more on the city and the agricultural landscapes and the working landscapes. A policy that focuses on our economy and on influencing our behavior. A kind of policy that leads to what we tend to call a nature-inclusive society. A society in which the preservation and strengthening of biodiversity are naturally intertwined. And where nature can cope well with, amongst other things, climate change, spatial and economic developments. How are we going to achieve this? To do so, the Netherlands has set two long-term goals. First, we are pursuing a full target compliance with the EU bird and habitat directives. And secondly, thinking about the long-distance relationships that Professor Diaz talked, spoke about, we want to at least halve the ecological footprint of the Netherlands in the world. So a significant reduction in the negative effects of our actions on our living environment and the environment outside of our borders. Our Ministry of Agriculture cannot do this alone because this requires fundamental social changes. We will achieve these goals only by beginning to take necessary steps, steps in the right direction. And I can see those steps before me. I want to envision the realization of the Netherlands Nature Nature Network, among other things, or the Nature Pact and the Nature Program. This also concerns the additional nature in reinforcement that has been deployed in connection with the ammonia approach. And even more is needed in a more integrated follow up of this approach. And I shouldn't forget the program on the large body works, which includes seascapes or our forest strategy and the contribution of nature to climate policy. The latter also concerns the peat meadow areas, typically such a cultural man-made landscape to which Mr. Diaz, Mrs. Diaz has drawn attention. But it's not, that's not all. More and different steps are needed. And that as Mrs. Diaz maybe likes, we need and want to focus more strongly on fundamental changes. Fundamental changes that also enhance nature outside natural reserves. I'm talking about that before mentioned nature inclusive society. It means that we want to work to ensure that nature is not taken in, that nature is taken into account in all decisions and actions. The success of the post-2020 global diversity framework will depend on the success with which we transform economic systems to sustainable production and consumption. This will also require targets to make changes to exploitation, trade and consumption policies that threaten the world's remaining intact ecosystems, as well as human and environmental health and well-being. Private and financial sectors will play an important role in integrating biodiversity in all their decision making to prevent negative impacts, but also to invest in restoration of biodiversity. We want to use nature more to solve societal, societal change, challenges such as sustainable food supply, water safety, storage, drinking water supply and health. We aim to use nature-based solutions, so to speak. These have to be win-win situations. No nature should help us, so nature should help us, but at the same time, nature should also benefit from it. And I'm sure it's possible. But how do we ensure that nature-based solutions are used and applied more often? Most important, I think, in the Netherlands is to implement the new course for agriculture in the Netherlands towards a more circular 
sustainable agriculture as laid down three years ago. Until recently, the common agriculture strategy was based on more and more technical measures, while rising the inputs like energy, fertilizer, protein, driving the costs of farmers higher and higher and forcing them, forcing them to scale up to become more efficient and, this, and to become more efficient. This new cause is steering away from the edge, shorten food chains, lowering inputs and lowering cost, less mass production, but towards higher added value while preserving a modest income. Not back to what we call in Dutch odd and seen style of agriculture, but to high skilled, commodity optimized and sustainable food supply. Besides that, we are, have already worked with provinces and other parties on environmental education and with the Duesendor, we call it, roughly translated as moving forward sustainability, knowledge and innovation aimed to a multi-stakeholder learning processes and education with, for example, University Chair of Transformative Learning and recently the start of a nature college. Such a transition must ultimately be given a place within many social and economic sectors. We do this to the following areas. A nature inclusive agriculture and more nature inclusive design of rural areas. Helping farmers to transform their business model. Nature inclusive building and urbanism and greening the city. Greening the businesses and financial sectors and nature inclusive energy transformation. The transition has also an empathic social component. For example, in line with the national program for rural areas, the national physical planning do document and natural links with other transitions as in the field of climate, energy and circular e energy economy. And I already said, I see steps in front of me, but I can't take them all yet. Major steps have to be set by the new cabinet, such as uh, new policy instruments, forms of private public pri partnerships and incorporation of financial incentives, subsidies and legislation and regulations. All those steps will only succeed if we take them all together. And I also look at our participants, to the scientists of the Netherlands and from this agency, we are our guests, to the biologists like Mrs. Diaz and her colleagues and to the audience. We also need you, for example, for those questions I still have, but because we can do it together. Only together we get closer to a desired nature inclusive society. I thank you. Thank you, Johan. Jorinda, may I ask you to give your comments on the presentation? Thank you, Professor Diaz, for your inspiring in presentation. I'm honored here to be your guest, and thank you for the opportunity to reflect on what Professor Diaz has presented to us. The discussion around biodiversity is important globally and in the Netherlands. As indicated, I'm the director of Bij 12. I don't have a translation as well, which is part of the Interprovinciaal Overleg, het IPO, for short. And Bij 12 supports certain provincial functions, including monitoring and collection of data. And most relevant to today's discussion, biodiversity conservation, management and monitoring. In the Netherlands, the 12 provincial governments serve a critical role in helping shape society's broader goals and ambitions into reality. They serve important fundamental functions in a multi-level governance strategy. By fostering robust discussion and debate, they help enable transitions at the different scales needed to realize our long-term ambitions and goals, including those for biodiversity. In particular, the 12 provincial governments serve as a crucial nexus. They help us to weigh the different and sometimes competing options regarding our finite natural 
natural resources, including biodiversity, and to seek together sustainable outcomes from an integrative perspective. To highlight more concretely the challenges that achieving the CBD's mission will present from a provincial perspective, I will provide you with three examples that link the current discussion and thinking and structure with corresponding roles and responsibilities of the provincial governments. By 12 supports the provinces in these areas and therefore has relevant strengths and cap capabilities. Today, I will gladly share with you some of our approaches and experiences. The three examples focus on policy, management and monitoring. They center around biodiversity and nature, but of course, they do not operate in isolation. They interact directly and indirectly with other critical considerations, including promoting sustainable agriculture, mitigating and adapting to climate change, and making the transition to clear energy, fostering economic development, and creating a safe, healthy, and affordable living environment for everyone. The first example is about policy. The current draft of the post-2020 biodiversity framework sets four specific goals to achieve by in 2050. Each goal has corresponding milestones and there are also 21 additional proposed targets. What do these goals, milestones and targets mean at the provincial and local levels? How do we practically interpret and implement them? Let's look at one specific example, the target of 30% protected areas by 2030. With regard to protected areas in the Netherlands, provincial governments already work towards the full realization of the Netherlands Protected Areas Network. The current network protects approximately 26% of the land and inland waterways. Each province makes plans and maps that indicate where within the network natural ecosystems already exist and where ecosystems should be further developed and conserved. For a densely populated countries such as the Netherlands, fully implementing the current network is already challenging. We have, at the same time, other important considerations, such as the energy, energy transition and the need national, nationally to build nearly a million houses for our expanding population in the coming decades. The proposed 30% target for protected areas, if adopted here, would further increase this challenge. The big question is, how do we bring the multiple goals and targets together and still achieve the desired goals, results? How can we shape and develop a more nature-inclusive approach? We must move in concert with nature to help it thrive, as a thriving nature is fundamental to our health, economy and society. There are limits to how much we can exploit nature, both in the Netherlands and globally. The second example is about management. Provincial governments serve a critical function in nature management. The national government makes resources available for nature conservation and management, primarily through a mechanism called the Subsidy System for Nature and Landscape, SNL. Different organizations or individuals can request subsidies via the system to manage their nature areas. Via this system, the provinces, in cooperation with different land and water managers, such as Staatsbosbeheer, Natuurmonumenten en Waterschappen, the water boards, help secure biodiversity in the long term. Together, they protect and conserve a network of high quality natural ecosystems and resilient populations of species. Furthermore, referring to the short debate earlier between Professor Diaz and Mr. Momas, the system extends beyond natural ecosystems to agroecosystems. Landowners can request a subsidy to better manage areas to support biodiversity, including amphib amphibians, insects, birds and mammals. In addition, the subsidies help realize broader goals around access to 
and use of nature and nature areas. Areas with subsidies must remain accessible for the public for a major majority of the time each year. Finally, about monitoring. In the Netherlands, we have a famous saying, meten is weten, or measuring is knowing. Monitoring is an essential component of the provincial efforts to conserve and manage nature. The 12 provinces work collectively to design, implement and maintain a cohesive monitoring and reporting system with substantial support from by 12. Most importantly, provincial governments serve collectively as the hub central for the collection, flow and storage of data, knowledge and information over the states and trends of nature. These examples have shown you, I hope, that the provincial government will collectively play an important role in the Netherlands' contribution to realizing to the realization of the post-2020 CBD framework. Given the, given the increasing urgency of the important issues now collectively facing us, including the biodiversity crisis, their role will only become more important and challenging going, and challenging going forward. Nonetheless, the provinces accept the challenge. They seek a broader and more active role in, in integrative spatial planning and decision making and can help nav navigate a sustainable way forward in the long term. In the short term, we face several specific challenges that will require specific choices and actions. Here, in short, are a few examples. First, we need a renewal in decision making. Better government in which we work together to give direction and perspective for entrepreneurs and citizens. Together, we can foster more certainty for the future, including providing more clarity for farmers, entrepreneurs, nature managers and citizens to make long-term investments for the future. Such an approach will help enable the necessary transitions that need to take place. Second, we need multi-level governance that works both horizontally and vertically. Each level of government has specific democratic le legitimacies, instruments, powers and responsibilities. They need to work together in an action-oriented approach. We need to organize, organize regional partnerships in which government, stakeholders and citizens are well involved and work together on proposals solutions and plans across scales. Third, multi-level governance can better organize stakeholder participation across local, regional and national levels. The landscape is changing and this is an emotionally charged, charged development. We must organize the input of stakeholders in a structured manner and include it in decision-making progress. Communication is essential here. Transparency about the choices is essential. Finally, from a provincial perspective, we need increased capacity and new instruments for decentralized implementation. We need a clearer picture of the integrity and quality of nature and of the factors on which it depends. We can monitor both more closely and effectively. Second, we need better knowledge about effective management of nature areas. And third, we need increased organizational strength in the region. In practice, success depends on people who speak the language, know the people and can make connections. Long-term programming and monitoring are part of this approach good access to knowledge, better use of available data and the deployment of seasoned professionals are important precursors for success in the long term. In the Netherlands, we are ready. We stand on the threshold of a new age. Our landscapes will and must transform in the coming decades to meet our collective challenges and ambitions. This will involve us all, government, stakeholders, citizens. Thank you.
Thank you, Yolanda. Thank you very much. Well, Professor Diaz, you've heard the two discussions. Is there anything you want to respond to them as a first cry of your heart in the sense that, you know, you have some, there are many issues raised, obviously, but perhaps you would like to pick a few which, in a certain sense, you, like, you find worthwhile uh, starting a discussion about. Feel free. Well, the, the first um, cry from my heart is that uh, what I heard from the two speakers just uh, renew my hopes in the future, really. Mm -hmm. um, your speech seems to be ticking every box I could possibly ha have from the ecological point of view. I, I think it's, it's, it's fantastic that you have been thinking of it and you are uh, very seriously thinking of implementing all these measures. And it's really, really comprehensive. Um, just, uh, I'm, I'm feeling an echo of my own voice. I don't know whether that can be solved. Um, okay. I think they're going to try to do something about it. Okay, okay. Right. Uh, I have just two very quick um, comments and reactions that are, I would say, um, just elaborating on what my colleagues have been saying, not, not contradicting them. About the 30 by 30 goal, um, if, if, the, if the target, if the, if the spirit of this goal is maximizing the amount of biodiversity conserved, right? Because I, in, my, in my talk, I insisted that protecting 30% of the surface is the means, is not the goal, right? Um, what the, the real goal is, is just by, by doing that, just, uh, saving as much diversity in the world as we can possibly do, right? Yeah. Um, it's not, there is not automatic uh, connection between the two. For example, the, probably the only Aichi target we almost achieved was target 11, which was about uh, protecting a certain amount of the planet's surface. We almost yep. achieved that, but nevertheless, nature kept declining fast. So we don't want a 30 by 30 goal achieved, but biodiversity going down even further. So I, I'm not sure that uh, making sure that we cover 30% of each and every country with protected areas is the solution, right? It may not be the most efficient worldwide because there are some, first, there are some countries much bigger than others. And, and second, uh, there are countries that contain much more of the world's biodiversity than others, right? So it has to be something that all the countries take on board and, and support uh, but not necessarily the best way is covering 30 by 30 percent of each country, especially if you are talking about um, protected areas. If you are talking of other biodiversity friendly measures, then it would work. Um, and I have another comment, but I, I think it's uh, probably better than start the conversation with my colleagues and can always come back to it. But, but if you, one of the issues which is obviously there in the middle of that discussion is how do you come from global targets, whether they, they are protection area based or biodiversity based, how do you get from global targets to local or regional targets given the wide diversity of functions and space? As said before, I mean, the Netherlands is a very densely populated area and how can you compare a country like the Netherlands with, for instance, Germany or France, in which there is much more green space available? So how do you get, how do you get this, this, this sort of scaling up and down of, of targets in a proper way so that people can, in a certain sense, understand what's happening there? I, I can start answering this, but of course it will be to the other two speakers uh, to, to 
to say much more because you are the ones who deal with the country and provincial levels uh, yeah. targets and objectives. Uh, from the ecological point of view, there are a number of uh, modeling and prioritization exercises worldwide that point to those areas of the world that are the most promising from the point of view of biodiversity, carbon storage, and um, minimizing the agricultural loss, right? Mm -hmm. So we, have, we, we do have the maps available. Um, now, of course, uh, these areas are somebody's land, right? Yeah. <laughs> and that's the problem. Now, the problem about whose land it is and how do you do in a socially acceptable way, yeah. that is definitely, to me, uh, a tar a, an issue of, of social negotiation within the countries and within the provinces. Yeah, okay. Uh, I have to say to the audience, there is a chat function out there. So you can pose your questions on the chat and then they will end up in my hands and I am able to give them, when they have a proper role in the discussion, I must say, I can give them to either Professor Diaz or the discussions down here. Um, one of the questions I have here in my hands is from Shera van den Wittenburg, and this is about land sparing. Land sparing is very often used as an argument to motivate intensive agriculture because more extensive agriculture, given the food demand in the world, will imply we need more land. Now, this land sparing argument, what do you think of that, Professor Diaz? Um, I don't think there is a universal uh, answer to land sparing versus land sharing. It depends a lot on the context. Mm -hmm. um, Land sparing uh, can work in theory very well in areas in which you have a very, very strong more, uh, governance and control and enforcement. So maybe you can do it in the Netherlands. I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know your local context enough to make sure that uh, only the land that is needed is submitted to high intensive agriculture and there's no spillover. Mm -hmm. uh, now, in, in, I, I mean, I can see it happening in my area of the world and land sparing uh, has a huge social and uh, social um, collateral damage. Yeah. Um, so, again, I think it has to be uh, tailored to the local concept. I would definitely not recommend land sparing as the universal solution mm. to the food and, and biodiversity question. Mm -hmm. Could you, in that sense, also relate back to, to Johan Ozinka's presentation and this idea of the circular agricultural economy. Uh, in, in what sense in a, does circularity play a role in your notion of a, a, a working or shared landscape? The scale in which we, in a certain sense, get resources and reproduce resources and produce products and, I don't know, carry goods around the world. Is that also a point of attention in your idea of a proper working landscape? Sorry, I, it was that a question for me? I thought yes, it was sorry, for my Yes, sorry, it was a question for you, Professor Diaz. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, this, this idea, this, this notion of circularity and the circular agriculture. Yes. Uh, the question was, how does that play a role in your notion of the fabric of life and especially in this, this idea of a working or shared landscapes? Uh, I guess there are two ways of looking at circularity. One is at this local level. Mm -hmm. So to make sure you take care of all your waste and all your spillovers. And the other, which is much more difficult, is the planet scale circularity, right? Yeah. In the sense that there's not, re I mean, when you discard something, it never really goes away, you know, completely disappears into thin air. 
you can, I mean, it may disappear from your local landscape, but that means it's just dumping somewhere else. And in the other way, in the other, ha um, in the other, um, otherwise, if you are uh, consuming things, they, they are just not created by magic all over again. I mean, there is a, a, a dynamics of energy and matter at the whole planet. So to me, this level, this um, idea of circularity, uh, which I think is just another way to call this fabric of life approach, mm -hmm. has to do that. Had to do had to be scaled globally. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that uh, the this idea of taking care of a global the, of uh, the Netherlands responsibility in global circularity through the decrease of biodiversity footprint mm -hmm. worldwide. Mm -hmm. It's a wonderful one. Uh, there are huge, huge um, social challenges, social and economical challenges in this. But I am absolutely delighted to hear that you are already thinking of it and you already have even a number by which you want to decrease it. So to me, to, just to make a very long um, uh, answer to the idea of uh, circularity is fully compatible with of life provided by circularity you mean global not just local yeah 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 okay um could we turn to your idea of the fabric of life and the broadening of indicators or targets in a framework to come uh, you're moving a bit away from, say, single target uh, uh, goals, uh, single issue targets, single facet targets, like the 30% protected area, and you want to move to a much more comprehensive approach. But then again, you know, strong policies, as we saw in Glasgow, as we see in Glasgow, we saw in Glasgow and see in Glasgow, I mean, strong policies need strong targets. Because in a certain sense, we have to take policymakers accountable for the policies they develop. Now, how do you see the possible translation of your more comprehensive notion of nature policy towards these sets of indicators? What is your idea about this operationalization of such an approach? Uh, okay, I, I try to give a a broad answer because you probably don't want me to go into the details of how I would um, no. write down the indicators. Yeah. That is exactly what we put together in our summary card to say, uh -huh. okay, when you're looking at, for example, net loss, this is what you have to take into account on the indicators and take care you don't do that and yeah. that. Or for example, another example is we say, don't focus in your indicators on just decreasing the number of threatened species mm -hmm. because you can decrease the number of threatened species by putting the whole planet on near threatened category. Mm -hmm. So you take the indicator, but you still lose diversity, right? Yeah. So we have a, a myriad of, of these little recommendations in how to implement all these uh, indicators and and and, and yeah. targets. In general, I would say, first, try to be as ambitious as possible with the species, with the genetic diversity, with the nature's contributions to people that are produced not only by working landscape, but by protected landscapes too, mm -hmm. and also by ecosystem area. We need them all. What I was trying to convey is that we don't believe that having one goal say, well, if we protect ecosystems, then we will protect everything else. If we protect enough uh, area of ecosystems, we will also take care of species extinctions, of genetic diversity, of nature contributions to people. No, we need to be explicit and we need to have high levels of ambition in each of them. Mm -hmm. And one, one thing that uh, it's interesting to, to think about, uh, you said something uh, 
Mm, you said, uh, let me say if I say, okay, measuring is knowing is your, is your motto, right? Mm -hmm. uh, this Dutch uh, saying. Yeah. Well, I think it's right, provided, provided you measure the right thing. Uh, because there's something called uh, Goodhart's Law. I don't know whether you, you've heard of it. It means that when a measure you use to, as an indicator of a goal becomes the goal in itself, yeah. then it's not a good measure anymore. Yeah. So if those monitoring indicators, for example, countries can gain the indicators, mm. like say, okay, let's put as much protected, let, let's put as much surface of the earth under protected area. Okay, what we want to maximize is surface. So just maximize surface, don't see whether that area is, is rich in species or not, whether that area is going to change with climate change, or whether this area is not going to change anyway, so it doesn't need to be protected. Yeah. Yeah. Just make sure we, we tick the box of protected area surface. The same with species, yeah. as I say. Uh, uh, we can uh, game the threatened species indicator by saying, okay, just make sure the whole planet is just near threatened, right? <laughs> and we get it. So yeah. it's basically trying to become as proof as possible against the good health law. Could I, could I ask you, Johan, to reflect a bit on this? Um, um, as Professor Diaz is saying, you know, we, we have to be very keen on the monitoring system and, 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 and in a certain sense also a plea to have a monitoring system which in a certain sense links in to this notion of the fabric of life. Mm -hmm. So not just amount of protected species or protected areas, but we have to look at the goals for which we want that protection to serve. So that's about biodiversity. But what's, what's your view on, on the current monitoring system and, and how that would have to be developed towards the future? Well, I think, although we are not in all the, in all, all the sense and still say at the level we want to work on, but. Mm -hmm. I think the Dutch monitoring system is already a bit looking to what, is the, what, what species are there, are there the, the ecosystems, are they there, uh, what is the quality of the ecosystems. So I think, and, 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 and Professor Diaz says is right, uh, just don't take the box because but don't, uh, um, that, that doesn't say that much. Otherwise, on the other hand, um, the professor mentioned the example of a body mass index, but is it when it is two times too high, you're sure uh, you're not going to live very long. Yeah. So uh, I think it gives you, an, you, you can use those red lines, those ticks to, to, well, at least show you're working in the right direction but it doesn't say something about the quality of an ecosystem or doesn't say anything about protecting the species. It only says something about the change it is going to do that, but it, it won't do it by itself. So I agree fully on her, uh, on, her, uh, 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 on her opinion on that. And I think we're still working on it in the Netherlands, but I think we already have a quite sophisticated system. Are we there? No, not yet. But, well, uh, I think we are on the, on the right way. Okay. It's time. We have to finish. Uh, a good conversation always is too short. And we have the same experience here. There were many questions also in the chat which could have been posed to you, Professor Diaz. And I'm sure we would have a good conversation. But as I said before, uh, time is short. Um, I would like to thank you very much for your contribution this afternoon, for your lecture and for your comments. I would like to thank our discussants, Jan Ozika, Jolinda van der Ent. I would thank, like to thank also the technical staff behind this presentation. I would like to thank our viewers for joining in. I'm sorry that not all your questions could be linked through to the panel, 
but there is still time to debate later on, perhaps in other settings and sessions. Uh, thank you very much for uh, being with us, and I wish you a very pleasant day further on. Thank you very much. This ends our presentation. <laughs>